hi everybody welcome back i am with dr mark garner and we are going to go over my implant x-ray i am in south dakota at his office welcome thank you very much and for what is the me. name of your practice uh, my practice is orchard meadows family dental and denture clinic in rapid city south dakota and he just gave me a tour of his office and it is very nice i'm very impressed with what you have done and and just the care that he is putting in putting put into ev just everything every detail even even your front desk well thank you that, i appreciate that a lot of thought went into it so hopefully his, it works the way we expect his front desk only talks to people no phones no anything he has an office that takes phone calls so. yeah we have a little call center built into the office because we feel very strongly that Whoever's checking you in in the reception area can't give our patients the best customer service if they're on the phone. So we take the phones completely off the front. Yeah, so I, I'm very yeah. impressed. So we're going to go over my my x-rays that he did. He did a CT scan, right? Correct. And we're going to go over that and talk about implants and what he looks for in the CT scan to give somebody implants. Okay, so can you tell us what we're looking at now? This is my actual CT scan. This is me that you're looking at. So this uh, x-ray is a three-dimensional x-ray. It's a CT scan. Uh, we have it uh, in a program called Galileos, which is our implant planning program, and it allows us to virtually put implants in the bone so that we can see size, shape, position, uh, all of those kind of things. If, if whether one implant system is going to be better than another for specific patients and we can swap implants out and okay. all of those kind of things and basically do the surgery virtually so we know exactly where we're putting implants and which ones we're putting in which spots so we know things are going to work. Okay, do you want to start with the lower or the upper? Sure, I'll just start with this and this is this is what we did first. So you can see I've placed six implants on the top. Those are conventional implants. Uh, four mini or narrow diameter implants down here on the lower. This purple line right here that you see, this is where uh, I have mapped Michelle's nerves so we know that we know where the, the inferior alveolar nerve inside of her jawbone is. That, that's the biggest nerve in your face and you don't, do not want to hit that nerve when you're doing any kind of surgeries or procedures because um, it can create some problems. So my implants would be more in the front. Correct. It would be in in the on the lower. Yeah, in the mental region of your of your jaw. You can see that right here where this nerve exits your bone, and right here where this nerve exits your bone. Uh, all of the the most of really of the important anatomical structures are from this mental foramen back. Okay. So in between these two mental foramen, uh, we're able to have healthy, good quality bone with no major structures that we need to, to be careful of. Okay. So that gives us the safest place to put implants on the lower. And those are tiny, those are the mini implants, Not they're not big. Correct, these are not conventional implants. This is a system that I like to use, it's from Zest Dental Solutions, it's called a LODI system, L-O-D-I. It stands for Lower Over Denture Implants. These are, are narrow diameter implants for people who have narrow ridges or narrow amounts of bone. They only have a locator on the top of them to snap a denture in place. You cannot build teeth off of these uh, if you're using them how they're designed to be used. Okay. Other, other, I've heard of people doing it specific ways and working just fine to, to put a tooth onto one of these guys, but um, they're, they're basically designed uh, only for uh, denture snapping. And this mini implant will hold the same as a large implant? Correct. Uh, we want we want the same amount of surface area if we can. So the narrower the implant we get, the longer we want it to be, or the narrower the implant, the more of them that you need to help hold it in. Okay. These are 2.4 millimeter wide implants, which are very narrow. Um, so you can't just put one or two of them in and expect them to do the job that they're supposed to. You got to have enough of them to have enough surface area to hold the to hold the denture in place. Okay, can you show him show them the side view, yeah. like how narrow my bone actually is? Yeah, absolutely. So if we click on one of these implants, it'll highlight it so that we can know that this is the one that we're working on. And when we double click on it, it gets us where we want to be. So this here is uh, down here is a cross sectional view. So when we're looking at this implant, we're looking at this area here is her tongue space. This area out here is where her lip or her cheek would be. Uh, this is the, the inferior border of her mandible way down here where her bottom end, the bottom jaw ends like uh, in the chin area. And we'll get closer to that in a minute. Uh, and then this is the edge of the ridge where her denture rests on top of this ridge. 
Uh, and so you can see here, if we just measure the width of this bone in this spot, at the narrowest area where we need, really need it to be, we're at almost four and a half millimeters wide, right? Up here, up here at the top of this, where it's nice and thick, if we measure this area here, we're at a little over five and a half millimeters. Uh, and, and there's lots of lots of rules we have to follow when we're when we're talking about implants and one of them is that you have to have enough bone on the on the cheek or the the uh, lip side called the buccal plate and you have to have enough on the long on the tongue of uh, the tongue side called the lingual plate uh, and so we can change the diameter of this implant uh, and get a little bit bigger as we go from a 2.4 millimeter we can put a 3.5 millimeter one in there and, and you, can you can see that it got bigger. Yeah, the implant gets bigger, and the bone between the implant and the outside of the ridge gets narrower. And the narrower that bone is, the higher probability you're going to have complications with that bone wanting to dissolve, and then you have threads exposed on the implant and eventually implant failure. Uh, so if you don't follow the rules, you create problems. Um, but you can see how narrow that is. As we move forward in her, in her jaw, you can see how the bone gets a little bit thicker, right? Well, this area down here is her chin, uh, and, and this area here is where her tongue muscles connect to the back of her jaw back there. So this is my front bottom tooth? Correct. Okay. Yep. This is called your genial tubercles, and that's where your, your genial glossus muscles attach there to hold your tongue in the place. Uh, and so when we come up to this one here on her low, in the front on the lower right side, we could probably put a 2.9 millimeter implant in that, in that and still satisfy our rules. Uh, but her left side's a little more challenging than the right side. As you can see, as soon as we get past those, the front, the midline area and these genial tubercles go away, then that bone starts to get much more narrow here. Uh, and the next one is even more narrow. Her, her bone takes a funky little, little jog in on the tongue side um, and so we have to angle this implant a little bit in order to follow the bone. If we, if we didn't angle this implant and we put it straight in parallel to the other implants, it would perforate that lingual plate and create some problems for us. So we have to angle the implant and allow us to follow the bone, uh, but it can't be more than 20 degree angulation. And you can see we've already measured the angulation here. It's just over five and a half degrees. And so this is well within the rules of, of getting her denture to snap into place. When you look at this one, this is a longitudinal or a tangential section. And as we roll through that, you can see the hole here where her nerve exits her jawbone. We just want to make sure we stay far enough away from that hole that we don't impinge upon that. That nerve. is right there, correct? Correct, this little, okay. this little purple circle. Uh, and, and when you're looking right here, this, we're right here uh, on here. that little purple circle, correct? And as if I come this way, you can see, you'll actually be able to see the opening in her bone. This opening in the bone is called your mental foramen, and that's where uh, that, that neurovascular bundle will exit that, that bone there. So you can see uh, Michelle has enough bone in the front to do so many implants down there to help snap her denture in. If we were to come back here in the back, uh, one of the reasons we don't put bone or implant in the back a lot of times is because that bone saddles out very quickly. Uh, and here is the nerve that we've mapped, and here is the top of her ridge, and you can see how it slopes this way, uh, and then it dips in this way. This is a submandibular depression. Submandibular or salivary gland sits into this space. And so if we said, look, let's, let's just try to put an implant back there. Uh, we can We can get it set up to put a a mini implant back there, the same same size, 2.4 by 10. Uh, click OK, and then it allows us to put this implant back here. This is a 2.4 millimeter wide implant, only 10 millimeters long. Uh, and if we tried to put that in that bone, it would either perforate that lingual plate into the submandibular salivary gland, mm -hmm. or it would go right down into that nerve and create problems that way. So when you're looking at that, there's not enough bulk of bone back here to put an implant in. So we just know that we can't do anything in the posterior mandible. We need to work between the two mental foramen. I understand that. Now, would I need any surgery or anything to get ready for those implants on the lower? Not the way it sits right now. If we wanted to do um, wider implants um, or if we wanted to do conventional implants to screw a denture in, 
uh, then we would need some kind of preliminary surgeries here, uh, either decorticating this, this cortical bone on the outside. What and is decorticating? It's where you take a, a burr and you just cut off the majority of this hard white plate that you see here. That's the cortical plate of your bone. Okay. Uh, inside between the two cortical plates, that's your marrow space, right? That's mm -hmm. the trabecular bone. Uh, and so we would have to really kind of cut this bone off to get to all of the parts where it bleeds because we need bleeding in order to help us heal. That right? would help heal the bleed. Okay. Correct. I, yeah. Okay. And so all of the healing elements are inside of your blood. And so when we, when we put a titanium mesh cage from right here all the way out here like this, uh, and that mesh cage has um, human bone in it, either f autogenous from you or, or non-autogenous from a cadaver bone. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you mix it with um, some bone morphogenic protein that comes on a collagen sponges or collagen uh, tapes, and you just cut that up, mix it all together, uh, screw the titanium cage to that, and that titanium cage would come out like this, and then six to nine months down the road, you come back in and you take that titanium mesh off, uh, and then it has caused an area to be bulked out with new healthy bone. And that would that change the bone marrow space? Would it make uh, it bigger or would it... it... It typically does and it creates a new cortical plate on the outside. A lot of times that bone is, is um, much more dense than your, your normal bone is uh, because we're forcing your body to grow bone. So this is a, bl bone. a bone graft? Correct. Okay. okay. Yep, it's called a, a ridge augmentation where you go in and you build out the ridge. Now, when you were looking at this bone, you can see uh, the lingual plate comes this way, the buccal plate comes this way, and then it comes up to a little knife edge at the top. In order for us to be able to put implants in there, we can't start at that little knife edge and work our way down. So we'll have to make an incision across there and then cut that little knife edge off. And that's called? That's called an alveoloplasty. Okay. This, this is your alveolar ridge. A plasty means you're cutting something off. When you're doing an augmentation, it means that you're making something bigger. Uh, and so we would have to do an alveoloplasty and cut this little little knife edge off so that we have a nice flat area to, to put an implant. So in. that procedure has nothing to do with a bone growing, then, correct? Uh, the alveoloplasty has nothing to do with grafting. Okay. Oh, nope. You can. They're completely independent from each other. Sometimes you need both, okay. and you do them in conjunction with each other, but. If you're doing an alveoloplasty, it doesn't mean you have to do a graft. If you're doing a graft, it doesn't necessarily mean you need an that alveoloplasty. That means the alveoloplasty is you're cutting the bone off because there's too much. And you can't, it, that spot needs to go away so the implant goes in. Yes, not okay. necessarily too much because the more bone you have, the better it's going to be. But the wrong shape, the, the wrong, wrong shape, place the wrong kind shape. of thing. So we have, to, <laughs> we have to follow the implant rules. And one of them is, is that you have to put it into good bone. Those little knife edge... Uh, ridges like you have right there is not good quality bone. Okay. Uh, and it okay. will just impede the implants. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so that's what uh, the lower looks like. Once we work up to the top, Michelle has all of the problems that you could have on the top. Every one of them. Yeah. So she's got a kind of a fun little area up here. So when we work up to the top, it's the same. This is the, the same angulations, right? So this is still a longitudinal tangential. This is still a cross-sectional view. And then this is still an axial view looking at her from the top. Uh, so this cross-sectional view is the, is the easiest one for us to see this. As we blow this up, you can see how wide her ridge is. All of this is the roof of her mouth. All of this out here is her cheek because we're on the upper, upper jaw on the right side in the back uh, where she would normally have a molar or a premolar back there. And you can see that from here down, I've already measured that. We have 3.75 millimeters worth of bone between the, the inferior border of her sinus and the edge of her maxillary ridge. So my bone is this big right there. Yeah, 3.75 okay. millimeters. Mm -hmm. So this is a conventional implant. Uh, and a conventional implant uh, for our systems, the shortest one that we have is an 8.5 millimeters long. So it's not very tall at all. Um, and you can see that there's about five millimeters worth of that implant sticking up into her sinus. When you look at it in a tangential view or a longitudinal view, you can see the same implant just in a different view. This is the edge of her bone where her, where her bone stops and her gum tissue starts. That's where her denture rests. This right here is the inferior border of her maxillary sinus. Uh, and so you can see by looking at this, 
that implant is up inside of her sinus. And that's all the bone I have right there. Yep, that's it. And on the other side, it's even less. But on the right side, this is where we're at. So a lot of times what we do is if we're trying to screw a denture down, we either have to come in and do a sinus lift over here where we uh, do a lateral wall uh, window, come in underneath your cheek right there, cut a hole out of the sinus, gently lift that sinus membrane on, and then fill all of this up with bone so that your body will create new bone in that area. So that's what a sinus lift that's is. That's a sinus lift, correct. You cut this out and then yep. fill that with bone. That's correct. a sinus lift. Yep, but you have to lift the membrane of the sinus in order to get that done so that we're not putting bone into your sinus cavity. We're doing it underneath the sinus membrane so we keep that um, keep that sinus intact. Okay. Um, there's another way you can do a sinus lift, and it's like, it, 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 you would kind of do it on this one. Uh, it's a crestal approach is what it's called. You drill a little hole for the implant, and, and then you stick some instruments into that hole and try to gently lift the membrane from the hole that you drill for the sinus. That hole is called an osteotomy. So you go up through the osteotomy, and it's a crestal approach through the crest of that ridge. Um, but typically when we do that, we're trying to get a millimeter or two. Not very much. If we need five millimeters worth of bone, you really need to have a, um, a, a lateral sinus lift. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to, to stick instruments up inside of here and release all of this sinus membrane enough to give us the, the height of bone that we need to have. Right. So in order for me to have implants, for one, I need a sinus lift, and it gets better. Correct. Yes. <laughs> it gets better from here. If we're going to put one in the back, we're going we're gonna to do a sinus lift. Okay. And, and by better, she's not necessarily talking about more advantageous. And worse. It's yeah. worse. I and mean so worse. <laughs> even, even if we were to put this sinus or this implant in here and do a sinus lift, the other issue that we're running into is the width of her ridge is just not enough. This is a 3.25 millimeter wide implant. So from the outside of the implant here to the outside of the implant here is only 3.25 millimeters. Well, she's only got about 3.25 millimeters of bone, and we need to have 2.8 millimeters on the tongue side, and we need to have 2.8 millimeters on the buccal side in order to have enough bone width-wise in order to support that implant. So it's not just about up into the sinus. It's also about not having enough width of bone there. When we're trying to screw in a denture, you can't really do this when you're snapping dentures in because it, uh, a locator of abutments on top of implants, are they don't have angle correction built into them. They're all just straight. But a lot of times what we do is we angle the implant a little bit to get the platform of the implant here as far back as we can while missing the sinus, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so we can angle this implant up to 30 degrees uh, in order to miss that sinus and still get the platform of the implant as far back as we want to. Otherwise, if we were going to miss this sinus, and, and we would have to work like this. And now the platform is here uh, instead of being back here. And when we get the platform further back, what that does, it does is it, it minimizes the amount of cantilever from the denture hanging off the back of the implant that's unsupported. Okay. Uh, and so we want to have as minimal of an unsupported uh, denture as we can. Uh, and, and you can see that we can just scrape past that, that membrane or mm -hmm. that sinus uh, and get into this little chunk of bone that she has right here in order to get that implant in. But the problem really is, again, when we look at that in cross-section this way, right, you can see this is the tongue side. This is the roof of her mouth. All of this outside here, this is where her cheek is sitting. But as you can see, when we run through that, that implant perforates that bone. If we try to lift it up like this and get it into a good enough quality space of bone, there we are back up into that sinus again. So we struggle so, with width and height of bone on Michelle. It so I would need the sinus well. lift and then I would need bone grafting? Yep, you would need a ridge augmentation or a ridge split. We can do the same thing where we decorticate the bone and put a titanium mesh cage out here to widen the bone a little bit. Or sometimes we can do what we call a ridge split, where we make an incision in the ridge this way. We fracture this buccal plate out. We don't separate it from the from the tissue because we still need it to have good blood supply. Um, and so it looks like a wedge of, of open space in that bone that we fill with cadaver bone and bone morphogenic protein and all of those kind of things to help grow new bone in that little wedge of space that we created. And cost-wise, what are we looking at just for the top? Yeah, if we're going to do titanium meshes or ridge splits, uh, the amount of bone morphogenic protein that we would need to use in that, 
I bet you're twenty, thirty thousand dollars worth of preliminary surgeries before we even start talking about implants. Wow, that's just. Yeah. And, and it's a decision that even if I had all the money to do it, I don't think I want to go through all the pain. Yeah, the thing that typically keeps people from doing this is finances, right? Not everybody can write a $60,000 check to get implants and right. you know bone grafting and ridge augmentations and all of those kind of things that have to happen. Uh, and so even if you had the money, then you have to decide if, if it's worth it to go through all of this. And that's just something right. that's personal to every patient. Everybody has different... Uh, different things that they value in their life. I mean, a lot of people spend money to have plastic surgery and go through the pain and all of that to look the way they want to. Some people are willing to spend the money and go through the pain here uh, to have the quality of life that they want with their dentures staying in place. And Some I, people aren't, worth, aren't willing, right, and that's right, okay. And I'm not willing to go through this. Yeah. Just um, Right now, I can tell my denture sits, and it's a little squishy. Mm -hmm. It feels like it's sitting on a sponge, and now I understand why, because there's no bone up there. Yeah, mostly, mostly soft tissue. Uh, as we work around to the front of this uh, in her premaxilla area, which is between the canine to canine, we run into the same problem. Here you can see the implant is um, sticking out of the bone down here, and this is the floor of her nasal cavity, right? We can't go up into her nasal cavity there, and you can't graft that area. That's an anatomical feature that you need to have to breathe. Right. Uh, so if we just kiss the edge of that, we still have part of the implant hanging out here. There's another anatomical feature in the front of your mouth. As we run through this, you can see this hole right here. That's right? in between my front teeth? This is in between your front teeth, and it's on the tongue side of, of the ridge. It's usually on the roof of your mouth, uh, and this is your incisive canal. Uh, you have a big neurovascular bundle that comes out of this little hole right here called your incisive foramen. Uh, and then there's a lump of tissue that your body puts right there to protect that neurovascular bundle as it exits the bone and then spreads out to give your palate uh, feeling, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so once your front teeth are missing, then that incisive papilla usually becomes very prominent. Uh, a lot of times you yes. just don't notice it while you have teeth, but when the teeth are gone, a lot of people are like, hey, I got a lump right here. But that's a normal anatomical feature in your face, uh, and it's there to protect that neurovascular bundle that exits your bone right here. But we have to be careful of that. We can't put an implant into that space. So when you look at it this way, we're just hugging that, that canal right here with these two implants as we go through. Uh, and it will exit the bone right here that you can see, but we don't, we don't want to and impend that's, upon that. That would be my two front teeth right there. This would be your two front teeth, correct. Okay. Yep. Um, so we'll, get, we'll continue to roll this way towards her left side. Now we're on the left side, and it's a little more dramatic on her left side than it is uh, on her right side. You can see that the bone width right here is very minimal. We're probably looking at two millimeters of bone, maybe, from outside here to there. outside here. Yeah, we're just over 1.5 millimeters worth of bone, which is very, very minimal. Um, but you can see, hugging the, hugging the inferior border of that nasal cavity, we still have a third of this implant hanging out, that lingual tissue mm -hmm. there. Now this this uh, this this gives us a little bit of a of a different view. Uh, X-rays typically only show hard structures, bone and t and uh, teeth and those kind of things. They don't show soft structures like soft tissue very well. Uh, but on this specific view, you can see uh, for Michelle from the edge of the bone here, you can kind of see this this dark area right here, right? Mm -hmm. This is the edge of your gum tissue on the palate. And where this one starts right here, this is your tongue resting up against your palate. So that's why you, there's a little space between your tongue and your palate here, and that's why that area is dark. So it allows us to measure from the bone all the way to the edge of the tissue. Well, you got six and a half millimeters worth of soft tissue on the roof of your mouth. And that's a lot of the reason why your denture feels spongy, because it's, it's yes, resting on it's, all of that soft tissue instead of... You know, just a couple of millimeters worth of soft tissue bound down to the bone that would give it a much more solid feeling. A lot of that is just redundant tissue caused by all of this receding. The tissue stayed where it was, and the bone underneath of it receded. So, okay, here's a question. Is there a surgery that could remove some of that tissue so the denture goes up and sits on the bone? You can. You can, you can have a, a gingival plasty is what we call it. Uh, where we go in and we make an incision across the top of the ridge and then we do lateral incisions this way to remove a lot of that connective tissue and then sew that right back down to the bone again. 
uh, with some sutures that will allow that tissue to heal underneath there. Very, very uncomfortable and usually right. not worth the effort. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, very, very minimally do we do that. So then my surgery. arch on my denture would be much higher. Yes, it would be taller. Your vault would be taller. Okay. But there's lots of structures here. You know, this this nerve exits this this hole right here and then spreads out this way and it spreads out this way. Oh, it's not worth uh, it. And then you have a, and back in the back, back here, you can't really see it on this x-ray, but you have a, a greater palatine foramen that typically is about right inside of here. And it has the same neurovascular bundle that comes out of the bone and then spreads to your soft palate in the back and then comes forward here. And then the nerves coming this way and the nerves coming this way will intermingle at a specific spot, just usually right behind your canine tooth. Mm -hmm. um, and there'll be a little bit of overlap there between the two nerves. Um, but you can't just go in there and willy-nilly cut that tissue out. You're going to hit arteries and you'll hit uh, veins and veins you'll hit and all everything. of those kind of okay. things so and it's nerves. Not and so, to me. I'll just have a spongy yeah. denture. Yeah, and, and if you're thinking about doing that, have a good conversation with your dentist about it and they'll explain the pros and cons and the risks and benefits. And right. it typically is not worth the risk. The benefit that you get is not worth the risk that you, that you have to incur in order to do that. So as we continue to move, we get back here to this one where we've, we've angled it a little bit. That's this implant right here that we're looking at. We've angled that just a little bit to miss the sinus and still get the platform of the implant as far back as we can. And even after we've done that, she's got narrow enough bone here that half that, or a third of that implant's sticking out on her tongue side again. Right. Uh, and then as we go back, we're, we're in the same position here with uh, narrow, narrow ridge here. Uh, Sinus is coming way down like that, so you got half of that implant sticking into your sinus. Now you have something on your left side that you don't on your right, and and that's a septum inside of your sinus right here. So you can see this bone, mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes you can use that bone, uh, but yours is not wide enough for us to put that implant in. So that would really only be in the way for us. Mm. Um, so I have no bone, yeah. and I have sinuses that are in the way. Correct. So, so if you don't want to do that. And you don't want to do all the preliminary surgeries in order to get sinuses or to get a new bone and work around your sinuses. Um, there, there really is on the upper only one alternative implant, and that's called a zygomatic implant, where you have uh, a nice long implant. Uh, that's this is 8.5. Zygomatic implant might be 40 millimeters or so, uh, and it, and the head of the implant. Uh, is kind of in the same position here, but it, but then the implant travels this trajectory and then anchors into your cheekbone, your zygomatic bone, way up here at the top. And that's a very long implant. A very long implant, but very little of it is in your mouth. Sometimes they have to go through the sinus in order to get that done. Sometimes they can they can rest it outside of the sinus, just uh, underneath the tissue right there. Uh, and and Michelle and I talked a lot about that before we we started this video, so we have some pictures up here, right? So if you look at this image, this is what zygomatic implants look like. This is the, this is the length of the implant. We're looking at this image yeah, up here. And it goes up into the, into the cheekbone, but then exits at your mouth, and then you can build a prosthetic off of that. And this image is what it actually looks like in your mouth. This patient has three conventional implants in the front, uh, and then the, these big zygomatic implants in the back that transverse that sinus and, and hook into your cheekbone here. And then this is the platform of the implant, and this is an angle-corrected uh, abutment. So the screw hole to put this abutment into this implant follows the trajectory of the implant. And then there's a screw hole here that will screw the prosthetic down to the implant at this, at this angle. But that's what allows us to have... Uh, fairly parallel it, implants. This all side, the way across. that's a good picture right there. Yeah. Right there, you can yep. see that. You can, yeah, it starts here in your mouth and goes all the way up into your cheekbone. Oh, my land. So, yeah. could you do a snap denture on that, or do you have to have screw? Would yeah. it be a screw denture? It would be a better? screw denture because okay. the, the, the snapping pieces here are not angle corrected. Okay. Uh, the snap on piece would, would be in the same trajectory as the implant and it would make it hard to snap on. Now I'm not saying that you can't because right. there's lots of dentists out there that were, are willing to work with their labs and create custom pieces that uh, screw onto this and then they're angle corrected and then you can put a snap on it. My question really is if you're going to go through the expense and all of that, why still have your denture removable? Yeah, just you might screw as well it just in screw there. it in. Done with it. Yeah, make it easier so you don't have to worry about taking it in and out anymore. 
Well, I can say so. I am not, I don't want to go through the pain of this. Yeah, I don't blame you. I it's don't okay. want to do it. Yeah, and I know not a lot of, not all the dentists are like I am, but I don't judge. I give you options. You tell me what you want, and then we'll start directing the conversation and however, whatever you want. But right. if we look at this and you tell me I'm not interested in this, then that's okay. It's, so, it's your mouth and it's your checkbook, and you got to live with both of them, and I don't. Right, and so, I came here only wanting a top, implants on the top. Correct. That's what I wanted, not the bottom, because my bottom doesn't bother me right now. Yeah. The top does. Yeah. Now and I you see can, why. You can see why. You have significantly more bone on the lower than you do on the upper. So, so there's more to hold on to. How long do you think I have to get implants in there where I, it's good? Uh, it's hard to say. Uh, you, you know, if you've had this much uh, bone loss in the past few years, if you wait another year, there may not you may not have enough width. Right. You know, because as that bone dissolves, uh, you you lose bone not only height-wise this way, but down here in this axial view, you lose you lose bone width-wise. Right. And you can see from this view, the right side of your body is significantly thicker than the left side is. Mm -hmm. If you lose much more bone over here, you're going to kind of be out of luck. Okay. Well, now you need to be making decisions here soon. Yeah. Well... Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Anything yeah. else that I think that we covered everything yeah, here? I, I think, think anything that could it. happen was is here in my mouth. That's correct. <laughs> Yay yeah, me. So, so we have a lot had a lot to talk about. I think, I think we, we did pretty about good a lot here. Of things today. We sure did. Oh. We sure did. And I think I'm glad for for all you guys, I'm glad that I have all the problems. For me not so much, but I'm glad that <laughs> we could at least talk about them. We right? could talk about yeah. and show you <laughs> Everything that could go wrong is wrong here. <laughs> All Sometimes right. That happens. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Yeah, Carter. Really I really pleasure. appreciate you bet. You taking the time to do this. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. All right, everybody. We'll see you in the next video. Bye, guys. Bye.